All right, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, it's a great honor to be here. And um, just make sure my slides are going to be showing. Um, so I'm no stranger to Alberta. Um, my father was born in Medicine Hat. And for the first 25 years or so of my life, I was, uh, visited the province frequently to, to see my grandparents while they were still alive. I looked back at my, um, at my records. This is actually the fifth time I'm giving a, uh, a talk in Edmonton, the first one more than 20, 20 years ago, back in 2001. Um, so really, really excited to be here and honor. Um, and when Nathan first in invited me several weeks ago, I thought this was a great opportunity to pre-commit myself by giving him a title of a talk that I had never given before, and that I would use the time between then and, and, uh, and now to, to craft that talk to perfection. That seemed like a fantastic idea at the time, um, not so much over the last few days, but uh, I'll, see what I, I'll see what I can do. This talk is gonna have a little bit of a preamble, and then it's actually gonna be in, in two parts, roughly speaking. Um, the first part will be really a, a response to this title that, that I selected, where I'm gonna tell you almost nothing about a whole bunch of stuff. Um, literally putting 20 PhD theses on like one slide each. Um, and I'm gonna hope to get through that in about half the time. And then I'm gonna do a deep dive on one of our latest um, research uh, successes on um, Gran Turismo, uh, an agent, and I'll try to tell you some details uh, about that, and hopefully I'll have plenty of time to do that. So, diving right in, starting with the preamble. Uh, I'd first like to just take a moment or two to tell you about what's going on at UT Austin, the University of Texas. A um, lot of really, really exciting things happening. Um, we were awarded one of the first uh, institutes for the Foundations of Machine Learning, an NSF institute, uh, AI institute. We've used that to form a machine learning laboratory that's led by Adam Clivens. I'm a founding uh, member of a even broader um, cross-campus initiative on AI for good that we call Good Systems. Um, and that sort of was inspired by the 100-year study on artificial intelligence that I've been uh, a leader of over the past, uh, past several years. And I also, uh, one of the hats I wear is I'm director of Texas Robotics. And when I first got to, to uh, Austin in 2002, there were, I think, two people um, who were publishing regularly at the top robotics conferences. We now have 14 faculty publishing at ICRA and IROS across several, um, several departments. We have a beautiful new space. That's, uh, this is before we filled it with robots. It's an old gymnasium. And so I, I really hope many of you will be able to come and, and see what we've been, been doing at, um, at the University of Texas at Austin. So I'll start by just giving a, a one slide overview of my, of my research. If you've seen me give a talk any time in the past couple of decades, you've probably seen this slide or a version of it. The, the thing that drives my research is, is this question. I do many different things in my lab, but they all sort of come back to what degree can a, autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? And so if, from my lab, we publish in a bunch of different sub-areas of artificial intelligence. Um, as shown here, with a lot of special emphasis on reinforcement learning, and that's really where I'm gonna, what I'm going to um, emphasize today. We, both, we do both sort of bottom-up fundamental theory, new algorithms and, and theory, theoretical kinds of um, questions in all of these sub-areas, and also a lot of use-inspired research, problem-driven research. And so when I give a one-slide introduction, um, it's usually these, you know, I can uh, much more easily um, communicate some of the domains um, that, that, inspire, that inspire the research, things like robot soccer, general purpose service robots, autonomous driving. I usually show videos of all of these here, but I'm gonna do that throughout the talk, so I'm just gonna keep moving quickly. And then, like I say, I will end with uh, a deep dive onto our agent GT Sophie. So, I, I don't really need to go into, um, into the details uh, here. I think we're all on the same page. This is, uh, you know, the, the probably most, um, uh, you know, sort of, there's the most RL expertise in this room that to, to almost any talk I ever give. Um, but just to, you know, so we're all on the same page. Reinforcement learning, I think of it as really for autonomous agents, for the, the kinds of uh, question that I'm interested in as presented in the previous slide, reinforcement learning is the most fitting of all the machine learning paradigms. 
It's about agents uh, learning from experience, from a reward, uh, from a reward signal, um, learning to, to come up with better policies. It can be formalized as a Markov decision process. And really, I started my, my research when there were some really um, beautiful foundational theoretical results just, just emerging. Um, but also people recognizing that applications would require innovations to scale up. So, you know, in the, in the late 1980s, um, I started as a PhD student in the early 1990s, um, there was the, you know, the, the proof that, that Q-learning, um, a very straightforward reinforcement learning algorithm that just learns from a continuing stream of experience without saving any transitions, completely modeled, model free, um, could learn an optimal value function and, uh, and th thus an optimal policy as long as there was a table-based representation and you could visit every state infinitely often. Um, of course, in practice, visiting every state's impossible, so we need to do function approximation. And now, the theoretical guarantees are harder to come by, but there's also been a lot of, of great theory in this, in this space as well um, over the years. And then, you know, of course, there's also broadening the, the perspective not to just uh, be model free and just you know, have the experiences flow by you, but often if experience is scarce, you may need to save the transitions um, into, into memory and then uh, use a, a batch method or model-based um, model methods. And then as uh, you know, nowadays, I think in Marlos's talk this morning, he talked about some recent successes of practical reinforcement learning, but there have been successes over the, over the years. You know, the, um, things like backgammon and helicopter control, adaptive treatment of epilepsy, invasive species management. People have been using reinforcement learning uh, towards it being a tool for having, having it be useful um, since, you know, since the beginning. Um, and of course, it was, uh, became a part of the popular vernacular um, as in large part when uh, the deep team at DeepMind with deep roots here um, beat the human, human go champion, at least at all. And so I, ref you know, I sort of reflect on this is that at least at first, or the, the initial tendency for people coming to reinforcement learning is to think of, well, let's, what are the algorithms that work in theory that we can prove are, are working in a, in a finite Markov decision process? What are, the, what are the learning algorithms that are effective? And then let's just see, you know, when you're in the real world and there's state aliasing and generalization, let's just try applying them. And, you know, let's see what, what, if that works. And not surprisingly, it doesn't always work, right? The algorithms are, work in theory, but not necessarily um, not necessarily in practice, and so I've often taken the perspective of let's let's embrace the idea that the the world is um, there is state aliasing. You're going to need to generalize. Let's think about what are the learning algorithms that that are um, you know effective from from that perspective, and and you know see if we can make them apply um, more uh, more readily. So it's I sort of think of this as asking the question rather than should reinforcement learning work but more does reinforcement learning work, and, and when not, how can we make it work? And this is to say that, that I am, in this talk, going to take the perspective of reinforcement learning as a tool. That's not at all to say that I, you know, that I think it's uninteresting to think of reinforcement learning as a model of intelligence, and uh, I think there's many people in the room who, who you know, um, take that as the starting point. I think they're very connected, um, and, uh, and so I, I am interested in both. But I've been sort of, you know, just, I've been um, mostly, you know, I lean a little bit more towards the uh, thinking of, of let's try to make reinforcement learning practical. And that's really what the focus of this, of this talk is. So that was the preamble. I'm now going to go into this first segment of the talk where I'm going to tell you almost nothing about a lot of things. But I've subdivided into sort of a few lessons um, learned, the, 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 you know, sort of a line of each that I think you can, you can take home. These aren't unique to me. In fact, I've seen them echoed already in some of the talks just today from Marlos and Doina and, and Mike and, and uh, Rich and Patrick who were on here before. None of these are, you know, I think going to be necessarily um, earth shattering or, uh, but, but I think, you know, it's a way of organizing my, um, the lessons that have, that have come up in the, in the research I've done over the years and I'll use it as a framework to give you an overview of the things that, that we've done in my lab. Um, this is a, a big sort of restructuring of a, of a talk that I first gave at the Euro, uh, European Workshop on Reinforcement Learning in 2011, where I came up with these categories and sort of like, uh, like the acronym PRISM here. Um, and I've kept these categories. I think they're still apt, but I've sort of changed some of the, the lessons, um, the sub-bullets underneath them. 
and, um, and really heavily updated um, what's in here. So, so the talk is, is uh, it's gonna, you know, in each of these sections, this first part of the talk, um, it's gonna illustrate a couple of, of points per, um, per category. So with regards to representation, um, I'm gonna emphasize the need to choose the algorithm to suit the problem, rather than to try to think of a one size fit, fits all algorithm that applies to everything. That when you're thinking of reinforcement learning as a tool, you need to be, um, you know, to acknowledge that there are going to be times for model free, times for model based, things like that. And that there's opportunities to even learn or evolve the representation of your problem um, to, suit, to suit the problem. And I'll give a, 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 an example of that. I'll then move on to interaction. Um, and the two lessons there, multi-agent interaction is complicated. The fact that there are other agents out in the world um, that are learning at the same time is very complicating. Um, on the other hand, interaction with people, people are, can also be very complicated, but interaction with people can be simplifying, and I'll give some examples of that as well. I'll then talk a little bit about uh, synthesizing both by decomposing problems to use multiple different algorithms and also synthesizing different concepts that people have focused on in isolation within reinforcement learning. And the last uh, that I sort of you know, think of as, as being um, re related to mortality, that an agent that's learning is gonna have to leverage the, the past, that um, you, know, you shouldn't just keep learning from a bank blank slate over and over again, and also acknowledge a finite future. And I think, again, in, in Marlos's talk this morning, he, he had the, you know, the picture that the, the world is much bigger than the agent. You can't explore everywhere. And that's sort of the lesson there. And then finally, I'll just briefly uh, you know, talk about th something that's been a big commitment in my, in my research over the years on building, um, building agents. And that's where these lessons come from. And that's what I'll devote the second half of the talk to, talking to um, how we built one particular agent, me and a, and a team of many people. Okay, so diving in. Um, with regards to represent, uh, representation, I say choosing the algorithm to suit the problem. Um, there are many different learning methods uh, and, um, and there's many different problems. And so, you know, I think it's when you're using RL as a tool, you wanna be thinking of given your current problem, what's the right algorithm to fit it? And um, so we did a, a study that, that was comparing, in particular, when would you want to use model-free algorithms versus model-based algorithms. This was back in 2011, and the key to all of the slides coming forwards is that I'll give some references in the bottom. The picture of the, the first author or the first authors and their names will be sort of in the upper right and in, the, in these references. So this is Shivaram Kalyana Krishnan, Krishnan back in 2011, who was a part of his thesis. Um, created parameterized learning problems that we could vary across five different dimensions and then plotted across all these different cross sections. When would you want to, when would a, a model free algorithm such as SARSA um, work better? When would a model based algorithm, or, or a poli sorry, a, a, no, the, the, in this slide I'm showing value function based versus policy search, sorry. Not model free versus model based. That was also something we looked at. But um, so a value function based algorithm such as SARSA versus a policy search algorithm such as CMAES at that time. Um, and, off, and in many of the plots, we saw a crossover. That as we varied some of these parameters, one type of algorithm would do better than the other. Not always, sometimes one would dominate. Um, but this was, I think, a very in, enlightening and useful study, and it's in, uh, there's, there's a lot of room to update it. I think many of the lessons will still uh, carry over, but of course, the algorithms have changed, the problems that people are, types of problems people are interested in have changed. Um, this is an approach that I think is, is very um, important to pursue. One example of choosing the, an algorithm that, uh, to suit the problem was when we used um, policy gradient reinforcement learning for robotics. Nate Cole and Peggy, uh, Peggy Fiddleman, we were looking at problems such as, as the one shown here, um, inspired by robot soccer, where we were just trying to get robots to walk quickly or to learn to, to pinch the ball under their chin. With all the learning done on the robot, so the thing that, the reason this sort of made a splash when we released it is there was no simulator. All of the data was done, all of the training was done on the robots. It took a matter of about uh, two to three hours of starting um, from a sort of a reasonably, you know, a, a competent policy that wasn't very good to uh, all the way to world-class performance. Um, and the way, you know, the key to doing it was uh, efficient gradient approximations um, in a in a carefully chosen low dimensional policy representation. So there were 12, for the walking case, there were 12 continuous parameters um, that, that basically were governing where the end point of the leg would go um, in the shape of an ellipse. 
and that was parameterized with uh, parameters like these ones, and then the robot was just experimenting with settings of those until it got to a walk that was as fast as possible with all its evaluation done on board um, and all of, all of its experimentation. As you saw, there were sort of three robots gathering data simultaneously, so it was parallelizable, um, but it was happening uh, fully autonomously and in real time. Another example of, of choosing the, um, the algorithm or the representation carefully, this is Matthew House Connect's thesis, um, where he looked at hybrid action spaces um, in an actor-critic kind of setting where um, there would be uh, a, a sort of a backbone of a, of a neural network. This was early, early days relatively in 2015 and 2016, where it would output both the discrete action class, like should you be kicking uh, the ball or should you be passing, should you be running, um, and then also the parameters simultaneously, and, um, and then having it based on which uh, discrete action was selected, match it to the correct parameters, but having all the learning happening um, in the same network. And then he also looked at partial observability, where we were looking at um, having recurrency, having LSTMs be across um, the, the, uh, the critic um, and the actor to, to be able to take into account in a, in a version of Atari where the, the screen would flicker to black every once in a while. So you needed to have memory of what you'd seen in the past. Um, and so we needed to sort of suit the, the algorithm and the architecture to the problem that we were um, addressing. And then I also said that there's opportunities to learn the representation itself. Um, and, uh, and in particular, this was uh, the work of the thesis of Shimon Weitzen, who was working also with Risto Mikulainen. Um, they had an evolutionary algorithm called NEAT, which could learn neural network topologies. And, um, and so Shimon devised an algorithm, or a, 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 yeah, an overarching sort of hierarchical algorithm where um, NEAT was experimenting with different neural, no uh, neural network topologies that were then being used and evaluated based on how good they were as function approximators for a reinforcement learning agent. And this was 2006 when everybody knew that neural networks were horrible function approximators for reinforcement learning. If you wanted to get things working on mountain car, you know, you could use a CMAC, you could use radial basis functions, but a neural network, that was going to diverge. It was never going to work. Um, it turned out by, by using NEAT, uh, if we, oh, and, and the only way you could get Q-learning to stabilize was by really dramatically lo lowering the, the learning rate so that it wouldn't diverge. If you kept learning, then this red curve would have you know, sort of tanked. Um, and, uh, and basically, the, what NEAT did is it learned a very sort of counterintuitive neural network uh, topology that was sort of fully connected um, connections, fully connected layers, but then some skip connections. It was five layers deep. Um, it's something that nobody would have come up with by hand, and it ended up with state-of-the-art performance. Um, and you know, better than any of the sort of uh, neural network topologies we would have considered. And so um, I think this is now, of course, uh, there's, there's uh, people now looking at, at learning the representations much more complex than this one. Um, and I think this, is, this was sort of a precursor to that work. So that's the, you know, the, the uh, idea of, of representation. I talked both about choosing the algorithm to suit the problem and, and learning uh, the representation to suit the problem. Now moving on to interaction. So um, Rich was one of the first, he was co-author on one of the first papers to do multi-agent reinforcement learning. This was back in 2021, uh, uh, 2001, sorry, 2001. And then we expanded to a journal article with Greg Kuhlman. Um, where we, uh, when we were working at AT&T Labs together, he's always been laser focused on the question of intelligence, by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, at this time we worked together on how, how could we um, get reinforcement learning agents to do this task, which was, I think, at the time more complex than most uh, reinforcement learning tasks had been, been asked to do, uh, in the sense that these red agents were trying to keep the ball away from the blue agents. They started from random behavior, randomly, not fully random, but randomly deciding when to pass, when to uh, hold the ball, and where to pass, and then over time getting to um, much, much longer hold times. That's what's shown by this graph. But, um, but what I want to emphasize in this graph is that we looked at two different, uh, three different cases. One where there was just a single learning agent and the other two were hand-coded with good behaviors and it could learn very quickly. When we just had two agents learning at the time or three agents learning at a time, um, suddenly you know, the learning performance it, it, um, was much slower, right? So it, it still learned in the end. It got to good performance of long hold times. But that made it very clear right from the beginning that just having multiple agents learning at the same time would made things much more difficult. Um, 
And so we, you know, we've looked at this from, from many different perspectives. Doran Chakraborty looked at uh, uh, how can we characterize optimal multi-agent learning algorithms uh, or agents, optimal multi-agent learners, um, with the insight that actions in a multi-agent context serve a dual purpose. They can yield immediate payoff, they can give you reward, which is what you're trying to maximize, but they can also train other agents, right? If they're your teammate, they can train them to expect what you're going to do, or if they're also if they're your opponent, they can train you know, them to predict what you're going to do. And, um, and in this context, an optimal policy would lure other agents to learn exploitable behavior that you can, you know, if they're your opponent, that you can then take advantage of. The concept of bluffing in, um, in poker so that people, you know, won't, uh, you, that, that you're not as predictable. Um, and so Doran came up with a really nice algorithm, convergence with model learning and safety, that was the first multi-agent learning algorithm that achieved three properties, convergence to a Nash equilibrium and self-play, um, convergence to a best response against memory-bounded counterparts, that's the part, part where it was learning to lure them uh, you know, into doing something that it could then pounce on f further, and also never doing worse than Minimax, even if it was playing against somebody other than a, um, a memory-bounded counterpart. And this had PEC con convergence guarantees. This was a theoretical thesis, but, um, but, was, uh, but also then we applied it to some, um, some problems in ad hoc teamwork, which I'll talk about next. One thing I've been working on and, and really focused, uh, really inspired by or fascinated by over the past decade and a half is this concept of how do people cooperate with previously unknown teammates, right? There's one thing if you're trying to make a team of agents like in the work I showed with, with Rich on, on Keep Away where we had all the agents learning to, to be a team right from the beginning. But people are able to play pickup games, right? To be able to play with people you've never seen before or to, you know, if there's disaster rescue, you can go and people can bring robots from around the world and work together somehow, even though you've never known those people before. And the, you know, so the, um, ad hoc, the problem of ad hoc teamwork is trying to, to create a good team player, where the, your teammates may be suboptimal, they're unknown, and they're going to be programmed um, by others, or they may even be people. And we've looked at this both from a theoretical perspective, um, but also uh, in applied domains, things like the, the predator-prey domain, where there's a, you know, the, the agent in this video, the one with the star on it, is um, one that that's has, has to cooperate with several, several different um, teams of otherwise coherent teammates that, that were programmed as a part of a class where the students took, had to program four predators to capture the prey and we had like, you know, 40 examples of that and then we removed one agent from each team and created an ad hoc teamwork agent that had to fit into any one of those teams and similar concept in the, the soccer case here. Um, and we've even applied, there was, a, there was a few years where at the RoboCup in this competition, there were, um, uh, pick up soccer games, pick up RoboCup soccer games, where teams uh, would each, this was a team of, of um, you know, one robot from each team coming together and they'd never played together, having to figure out how to work out as, a, as a team. And so, you know, what position should they play, where should they pass? And so there were um, agents that were evaluated in this, um, in this context. And this was a thesis of, uh, supported PhD theses by Sam Barrett and Katie Genter and a postdoc Noah Agmon. Now, I did say that, that you know, so multi-agent interactions, it's fascinating and it, it can be complicating, um, but starting with the work of, of uh, Brad Knox and then following up with, with Garrett Warnell, we also um, explored the idea that, that human interaction can also, be, um, can also be leveraged, can be simplifying. And so um, Brad introduced a, a concept of, called Tamer back in 2008, where uh, the idea was, he, and he first applied it in the game of Tetris, where what you see up in the top left corner here is just a person, uh, when it flashes red, a person was said, saying that's a bad move. When it flashes green, the person's saying that's a good move. Um, it starts from, uh, you know, sort of random behavior. And Tetris at the time was a game that you could use reinforcement learning after thousands of episodes to get a pretty good policy. Um, but here, uh, the, after just two episodes, we would learn a policy that was not as good as the reinforcement learning agents, um, but quite competent. And so, you know, here's, here's again, after about two episodes of a person giving that good, good move, bad move sing, signal, uh, we got a policy that was able to, to clear hundreds of lines. And, um, and then there's, you know, there, were there was a lot of follow-up work on learning both from human feedback and autonomously to sort of get the best of both worlds, to learn quickly at first and then fine-tune to do as well as the reinforcement learning agents. And then Garrett came along several years later, um, extending it to video input in, the Atari, in some Atari games in what we call Deep Tamer. And really this, I think, was, uh, I think Brad has a, a strong claim to this being one of the first 
if not the first examples of reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, you know, th this wasn't actually just invented two years, you know, a year or two ago for ChatGPT. There's been a community that's been working on reinforcement learning from, from human feedback for, for many years. Um, and this was also followed up by, by Faraz Tarabi, also with collaboration with Garrett on um, a, a, some nice algorithms for imitation from observation. When you, have, um, when you have some examples of good behavior, but you just have a sequence of states, you don't necessarily see the actions that were given to the agent. Um, Faraz introduced algorithms for both um, a model-based uh, version that we called behavioral cloning from observation and a um, model-free method called generative adversarial imitation from observation, um, where we got really good results on um, learning policies from um, state-only demonstrations. Okay, I hope I'm, you're, uh, you know, this is the, we're still uh, going through the whirlwind part. I promise to slow down soon, but um, the moving on to synthesis. So um, Shivram again was, did uh, sort of built on the work that that, uh, that we had done in Keep Away for um, for where, learning how to pass to also include um, having the agents learn where to go, how to get open. Um, and that was an example of when you wanted to use policy search for one, one case and value function based method for the other and then put them together after decomposing the problem. This was sort of you know, inspired by my own PhD thesis back in 1998 introduced this concept of, of layered learning, of decomposing the, the problem and using different algorithms for different components. And it was really taken to, um, to you know, uh, uh, the, um, I think, you know, a, a really good um, extreme with, with Patrick McAl McAlpine's thesis in 2018, where he, in, in the 3D simulation league for RoboCup, created um, a, in some sense, a curriculum, which I'll talk about uh, shortly, but of, of decomposed behaviors for things like um, approaching the ball. So you know, we're, the robot was just learning parameters on how to uh, walk up quickly to a ball, um, and then uh, separately, learning how to kick the ball as far as possible, so just placing it next to the ball, and you know, if it's in exactly that right place, can it le learn a kick that goes as far as possible? Um, again, through uh, through a policy search. In this case, he was using CMAES, um, and uh, you know, just trying it over and over again, and then combining these, putting the you know the fast walk. And, the, and you'll see sort of the, the color over the robot's head is sort of changing which parameter set it's using. There's like a, uh, this now, the S is for sprint, the P is for position behind the ball um, until it gets to a, a, now the approach and then it gets to a point where it wants to kick the ball um, and is able to put all of these together. And this, this actually became a part of an agent that um, won the 3D Simulation League of RoboCup for 10 years out of, in an 11 year period. Um, and this is really a, uh, a phenomenal um, uh, code base that, that Patrick created. And um, actually last year was the first year that, that, that his, his code base was, was surpassed by other teams. And so at this year's coming RoboCup, we'll see if we can get back into, um, into the throne. We'll have to see. There is also uh, the other component of this, this thread was synthesizing concepts. So Nick Jong, um, he did his thesis, another one of my early students, um, we're working in the, in the mid-2000s, where there were people in isolation working on function approximation for continuous states, model-based learning like the RMAX algorithm for sample efficiency, and MAXQ for, for hierarchy, and he developed a series of algorithms um, for, you know, that fitted RMAX and RMAXQ and then put them all together in, in uh, fitted RMAXQ that learned primitive action models, predicted um, actions in a continuous space, plan to explore uncertain regions and approximated values of abstract actions. And I told him, you know, as all of my students, it's great if this was another sort of theor mostly theoretically motivated and algorithmically motivated thesis, but I said, you can't just test your algorithms in mountain car for, you know, continuous states and puddle world for sample efficiency and, um, and, and taxi, which everyone was using for, for hierarchy. So Nick told me, okay, that's fine. For his thesis, he was able to graduate by evaluating a fitted RMAX Q in Mountain Puddle Taxi. So if you want to see that algorithm, he put them all together into a, that, that was his idea of an application. So we argued a little bit about whether that counted, but um, nonetheless, he, he did a fantastic thesis. And I think it's also something that would be worth revisiting. And then finally, for this segment of the talk, the, the whirlwind part, mortality, leveraging the past. And so Matt Taylor, many of you who know um, him here, was one of the first uh, to work on, on transfer learning um, back in, in 2007, where you know, the, the observation that, that you, the, the, 
value function might not be defined in the target task, um, and so introduce the concept of, um, uh, of, of transforming the, the value function from, um, from one representation to another, um, which uh, on relying on intertask mappings, and, and was able to show great results where um, you know, that we, that we could look both at what we called weak transfer, where if you, can, you know, considered the previous learning as a sunk cost, um, that you could, you know, you could do better. But even if you, um, you know, could, could decide that you were going to spend some of your time training on an earlier task, that would be worthwhile if you're aiming for a, for a target task. Um, and it had, had, I think, some really uh, inspirational results that opened up this, this large space of people working in transfer learning for reinforcement learning. And one way this can be taken to the next step is moving to automated curriculum learning, where it's not just about transfer. This was motivated, uh, this was the thesis of Sanmit Narvikar and is now being followed up by Zifan Shu. Um, we were inspired by this game of quick chess, where there's, um, you know, the, you can teach kids very efficiently to play chess through a series of games where you first have only pawns and you win by getting your pawns to the other side, then you introduce, you know, new pieces one at a time until before you move on to the full board. And we observed that you know, to do this in an automated way, based on a target task, you would need to do three you know, broad class of things. You'd need to come up with these tasks that can serve as the curriculum. You'd then need to think about how to sequence them and then have the agent learn on the simpler task and use transfer learning, as introduced by Matt, um, to, to sort of plan your way through this, this space. And so this was sort of a meta MDP, right, in some sense, that, that you know, your, your action now is which is the next task you're going to give your agent after it's, uh, after it's learned um, the previous source tasks, and your reward is how well you do in the end on the target task. And so I think there's, there's a really exciting space of, of, um, of algorithms now working on this automated curriculum um, learning concept, where the goal is to learn a general teacher agent, one that can select these tasks for, for agents. And by the way, this can also be now applied to uh, t selecting tasks for people to try to, you know, sort of very akin to intelligent tutoring systems. Also related to leveraging the past is, I think, the, the really fascinating and important area of grounded of uh, sim to real. And Josiah Hanna introduced an algorithm for grounded simulation learning, which is an iterative um, sim to real algorithm where we take some real world data on a policy, use it to ground a simulator by basically changing the parameters of the simulator so that the effects of the simulator for that same policy match the effects of the, that policy in the real world, and then using that sort of um, modified simulator to improve your policy and then repeating. So um, Josiah started with what was at the time the fastest known walk on the Aldebaran Now uh, or SoftBank Now robot. Um, this was a ro walk created by University of New South Wales that went 19.3 centimeters per second. And then after one iteration through this grounded simulation learning process, we got to um, a walk that was significantly faster um, at 26.3 at centimeters per second and then um, even further, uh, another iteration through to the fastest stable walk on this, on this robot at the time at 28 centimeters um, per second. And, and this had ended up in, in uh, Josiah's thesis had showed deep connections also to off policy um, learning and uh, with, with uh, you know, so in sim to real and it is in some sense the, the simulator is, is sort of an off environment learning in the same way that off policy learning is a different policy. We've also, ex uh, just briefly, we've ex uh, examined methods for distribution matching to bring the simulator in, in, in line with the real world. Um, this is some work of, of uh, Haresh Karnan and Ishan Durgkar. And Ishan even took this, uh, surprisingly, to, uh, uh, in his thesis, to a level where we could use these distribution matching algorithms, which fundamentally are about trying to um, come up with a policy that has the same state visitation distribution as some target distribution, where he used the target distribution to just be a Dirac distribution at the goal, right? It, as, it, it, you know, as if you could just teleport your agent to the goal, that would be the optimal policy. Of course, you can't do that, but, um, but Ishan was able to show that if you could use methods to bring the state visitation distribution of your policy as close as possible to this um, unachievable goal distribution, you could, this could help lead to um, efficient exploration, basically creating a more dense reward signal in an intrinsically motivated kind of way. And that was a paper at NeurIPS uh, just a couple years ago. Okay, and then finally, the final bullet here, and, and the other sub-bullet of mortality is acknowledging a finite future. 
And this is um, the, the work of Todd Hester. In reality, uh, I alluded to this at the beginning, in the reality, the, the world is much bigger than, uh, than an agent can explore um, in, in any kind of uh, you know, sort of exhaustive way. So uh, Todd's Textplorer algorithm was for targeted exploration, where you actively choose where not to explore, where never to go. Um, and he did this by learning multiple possible models of the world and comparing them and then only exploring at states that were both uncertain, where you want to improve your model, but also not just where you're uncertain, but where there's a prediction that it's going to be promising to, you know, uh, to learning an optimal policy. Driving off a cliff, you might not know exactly what's going to happen when you drive off the cliff, but your, your model is going to, you know, the, the, um, you, you can use forward look ahead planning to suggest that maybe that's not where you want to um, explore. And he applied this um, for autonomous driving. Um, he, where uh, we had our car that was in the DARPA Urban Challenge back in 2007. He gave it the task of accelerating to a particular target velocity in the way you would normally do with a PID controller. Um, where there was model learning and planning on parallel threads with a sample-based anytime planning like MCTS um, in the, working in the, in, the, uh, in the background. And he was the, the um, signature result here was that he was able to learn to maintain a target velocity um, just as good as a PID controller could after just 18 episodes of, of learning, which was, amounted to three minutes of driving where the actions were at 20 hertz, everything happening in real time um, without any pausing for, you know, uh, for learning the model in the background. This is from MLJ, Machine Learning Journal in 2013. And then, as many people have talked about here um, and are going to be continuing to talk about uh, lifelong or continual learning um, we've been working on in my lab as well, um, Bo Liu has been doing some great work with uh, Shui Xu Zhao and, and, and Yifeng Zhu also on lifelong learning for mobile robot navigation. Bo came up with a really nice paper at the COLAS conference last year on continual learning and private unlearning, which is sort of a privacy preserving continual learning, uh, which I'll be happy to talk about offline. And we're about to release you know, soon uh, a benchmark for knowledge transfer for lifelong uh, robot learning called Libero, and that's going to be joint work with, with Bo and, and Yifeng. Um, I think we're going to have a website live next week, so, so watch for that. Um, and then, as Nathan mentioned in, my, in, in the introduction, I also co-founded with Satinder Singh and Mark Ring, uh, Kojitai, which was really you know, fundamentally about continual learning, and that's morphed now into to Sony AI. OK, take a breath. Um, this was the whirlwind. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll say on this is, you know, I said building agents is important. Um, this, I'm just for two slides, going to use it as an opportunity to tell you about the other theses that I haven't mentioned. I've already shown you some results from our building agents in RoboCup, Robot Locomotion, Tetris, Autonomous Driving. Um, we've also done work with, uh, on trading agents, on developmental robots, on general purpose service robots general game playing, music recommendation, and a lot on, on traffic flow over the years. So to summarize, this, this first, uh, the first segment of the talk is um, I think you know, the, the lessons that we've learned over the years on practical reinforcement learning can be boiled down into these, these ones in underrepresentation, interaction, synthesis, and mortality, and especially on building, um, building agents. And this is all in the context of uh, the research question, to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? Just because I haven't quite shown you yet, I'll just show a couple of these videos that I, that I haven't um, uh, shown yet. This is what the RoboCup competitions look like, um, where they, you know, the robots are, uh, in this case, the robots with their arms behind the back are ours, um, learning fully autonomously, um, behaving fully autonomously. It's not all learned. Play robot soccer, and you know, we're still a ways from the RoboCup goal of by the year 2050 creating humanoid robots that can beat the World Cup champions. But uh, you know, we're making progress. Um, if you come to my lab, you'll see general purpose service robots like this one just wandering in the hallways. You don't have to ask us for a demo, we try to have them always on. Um, and uh, you know, we don't have an autonomous car in my lab anymore, but we still do think a lot about what the world will look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous rather than traffic signals and stop signs. We think intersections can look like like this one, and this is again agents that we've built over the over the years. But I'm now going to transition with the time I have left to tell you, you know, to, to, um, a lot more about one particular agent, one of the most recent ones, um, something called GT Sophie. And I would love if I could say, and it used all those eight lessons that I told you about. Um, 
It's not the case. It's, you know, it's using some of the ones, and actually a minority, I can directly say that it's about choosing algorithm to suit the problem, it has some multi-agent interaction, it's really about building, um, building the agent. Um, but uh, this is um, something that, that, that I think was, was uh, a really great work by a big team of people, um, many people shown here. All of these are the, the co-authors on a Nature article that, that was on the cover um, in a little more than a year ago, February of 2022. And I do see this, this as being in the um, stream of uh, examples of learning agents or, or AI agents um, beating the best human at something. And, uh, you know, sort of uh, Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov at chess and AlphaGo at Lisa Dahl at, at, uh, at Go, and there's been poker, and there's been um, Jeopardy, and there's been uh, StarCraft and Dota. This was, like all of those, um, the success here relied on a, a very, you know, a lot of computation, a great compute architecture, right at the cutting edge, with lots and lots of data, some top-notch engineering, and a few algorithmic and methodological insights that put us over the top. And in all the things I'm going to show you in these coming slides, the color, the agent with color is going to be GT Sophie, our agent, and the white one is going to be human, human controlled. And when we set out to do this, the conventional wisdom was that either this was not going to be a solvable task for, for uh, reinforcement learning, um, or that the way to do it was going to be through model predictive control. That's the way people were doing this, Ma mainly you know, picking a trajectory and then using control theory to, to try to follow that trajectory. Um, and that's not what we did. I'll, I'll tell you what we did in a minute. But um, for those of you not familiar, this was in Gran Turismo, which is, uh, they call it the real driving simulator. Um, it really is. It ha captures a lot of, of physics with really fine detail, including aerodynamics um, for slipstream effects, tire traction. Um, it is used as an esports e platform. There's people around the world who have put in their, um, their 10,000 10, hours to become um, experts. It's been used as, uh, for virtual Olympics platforms. And it's sort of, for those, again, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is what it looks like. Um, this is an all-human race where the, you know, the, it, it's, uh, people have, gone, have practiced in this setting and gone on to be, become Formula One uh, race car champions in real cars. Um, so this is, it's a, it's a very interesting problem. Um, the challenge we set out to, to, to um, uh, achieve was to challenge uh, the top human drivers. Um, this was in the middle of COVID, so we were restricted. We couldn't get people to travel from around the world, but it so happened that some of the best uh, human drivers in the world were from Japan, um, as shown here. And we challenged them to a series of three races in 2021 um, with a particular car and track combination. And just like the people who practice with that car on that track and learn you know, to, to memorize the details, we learned a separate agent in this case for each of these three tracks. Okay, now that's something we'll relax later in the talk, but in the challenge, that's something that we allowed ourselves to do. So what's the approach? The, uh, first of all, th the thing that made this different from chess and go and poker and, and other things was it was really a control problem that you had to be operating at the edge. GT Sophie had to understand car dynamics, send actions at 10 hertz if you know, there was no pausing and thinking what the next action should be. Um, and it had to be really be at that sort of razor thin edge where if you move a little bit faster, you're going to spin out a little bit slower, you're going to lose all of your advantage. And so this was a fundamentally different type of problem. And that's just on an empty track. Right, just being able to go when there's no other cars around. Once you get to the multi-agent aspects where there's cars you have to pass, you have to block, um, it becomes much more challenging. And then there's this third dimension, which is it's even sort of a uh, ill-defined problem, that, that in human races, there's a human steward, a judge, that is sitting there saying, what's fair? Um, you can't push another car off the track. You can't bump into other cars deliberately. Uh, if you do, there's penalties. And that's not really um, operationalized, in, in any, or that's not concrete. It's all human judgment. And so how would we convey that information to the agent? In the end, rather than the model predictive control approach, we did use end-to-end -end, uh, deep reinforcement learning. Um, meaning literally that, that it starts from random behavior where it's driving off the track, crashing into walls, doesn't even know that it should accelerate um, to get reward. Um, and uh, two weeks later or a week later, I guess about a week later, um, we had a superhuman um, agent. A week later after 
lots of development beforehand, but you know, that, that was what the training process would take once we tuned everything. Um, and um, so what was the, what's the interface? The actions were sending, it was a two-dimensional continual, uh, continuous action space, break or throttle from negative one to one, turning left and right from negative one to one, um, sent it, I, I guess actions were at 10 hertz, I might have said 20 earlier, but 10 hertz. Um, and uh, the reward was mainly just incremental progress across, uh, along the course. How much since the last time step have you moved um, forwards, you know, sort of uh, orthogonal to the center line of the, of the track. There were also some penalties built in for slipping or going off the course or hitting a wall, sort of shaping rewards of, 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 of some sort like that. The, oops, the, uh, the features, we did not do this from, from pixels. That's something that, that is, um, we have uh, looked at and in our, in our, there's ongoing research in that space. But the goal here was to do something that we could deploy on the, um, in the game and, um, and to be able to do that as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. We did carefully try to um, give features to the car that were sort of the same kinds of information that a person gets. Um, and in some sense, it's, you know, in some ways it's more precise, in other ways it's not as rich as what a person gets through their eyes when, when playing the game. But things like velocity along the different axes, the acceleration, the roll pitch and yaw, loads on the tires, um, car progress along the track, um, which was a track specific uh, number that we had, if we, we want to generalize tracks, we take that, that one away, but otherwise the, the features can remain the same. And so, and then there was also a, a sort of dots relative to the car indicating the upcoming shape of the track. So if the car is the green dot here, um, I'll show you know, in parallel, it would get these sort of purple dots showing where the left, right, and center of the track is um, upcoming as it's driving. Um, so you see it sort of, you know, these are almost synced where you see as you know, the white car is, is moving on the track. And you also see this is what a tuned policy looks like on an empty track um, after, uh, after training. So it's sort of uh, you know, going, using the whole track, it has to keep two tires on the, um, on the track. So it is allowed to you know, sort of use the edges like this um, and, and uh, learns to drift and, and cut it very close to the, to the edges um, in a way that, that, uh, you know, that people, um, maybe even closer than people did. Underlying this is a, is a huge compute infrastructure um, that uh, was a collaboration with uh, Sony Interactive Inter Entertainment um, and the makers of the game, Polyphony Digital. Uh, fundamentally, it's a, um, a role, there's rollout workers um, creating, uh, filling an uh, experience replay buffer for an actor critic um, style algorithm. It's based on soft actor critic, but we actually in, in, uh, introduced a new algorithm called QRSAC for this purpose, which was quantile regression soft actor critic. It's a distributional um, reinforcement learning algorithm, distributional version of soft, soft actor critic. Um, we used n-step returns, um, and we were able to show that, that using the distributional version um, was, you know, we, this is time around the track, so 114 seconds versus 115, which is actually a pretty big difference. Um, the end step returns uh, in the, uh, we found that, that you know, sort of five step returns was a good balance between computation and, and performance. Um, and interestingly, um, uh, interestingly, we were learning a distributional value function here, so learning, you know, sort of quantile or binned into quantiles when you take an action, what's the, you know, um, what's the lowest 32, I think it was 32 bins, so what's the, you know, the lowest quantile perform, uh, outcomes you might expect, so those would include the possibilities of running into a car or going off the track or hitting the wall, um, all the way up to the, to the best possible outcomes. But we were always taking the action with the highest expected return. And so, um, it turned, you know, learning the distributional value function was, was you know, more of a, um, you know, sort of an auxiliary task in some sense. It was l helping learn a more robust representation for, um, in the end, maximizing expected return. And we did do, we learned uh, you know, to, to um, reduce maximization bias. There was uh, two different critics learned and you select the maximum of them. The full details of this are, are exposed in the, um, in the Nature article. A few training details. Um, it was just, it's a, it's a four layer architecture. Um, this is some of the hardware uh, and some of the dropout, the, the different learning rates on the, um, on the actor and the, uh, on the critic and the actor, a little bit, so twice as, uh, twice as high of a learning rate for the, um, for the actor. We used clipped gradients. Okay, so those are the, the you know, sort of the under the hood details. Here's what it looks like. Um, after an hour of training, four hours of training, eight hours of training, and approximately a week um, of training. 
and so you see, you know, and even after an hour, it's moving up the track, but sort of wobbling around a little. It's still pretty wobbly after four hours. It's a lot more stable after eight hours, but we don't get the, the sort of fine-tuned, perfect behavior it, 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 until actually about a day. A week is, was overkill for this particular empty track. Um, this gives you a sense of the, of the learning performance. Um, to give you more quantitative, on one of the tracks, the built-in AI, the one that comes with the, the, the game, um, it, gets, it, it takes about 126 seconds to go around the track. These blue lines are the 100 best hu human time tri times recorded on Kudos Prime, the sort of the worldwide database. Um, and after 24 hours of learning, the uh, GT Sophie is doing as well as uh, all but the very, a very few of the best human recorded times. And if you look at the, the distribution of GT Sophie's 100 um, tri trial times around the track, um, only the best human, number one here, has, is even competitive with it. The mean times of the you know, second through fifth are, are worse. And that, that was only on one track. On the other tracks that we tried, um, GT Sophie is significantly better than even the best human on an empty track. But that, and that takes about a day. Being faster isn't, uh, isn't enough. We, I, there's still these other two challenges I told you that we had to, um, had to solve. So to include the multi-agent aspects, we augmented the representation to include the relative position and velocity and acceleration of any cars that were within a particular distance of, uh, of GT Sophie. And we added rewards for passing a car um, and negative rewards for being passed and actually for even just closing the distance, um, either in a positive way or a negative way. So it was one additional sort of class of shaping rewards. And then, crucially, we had to curate the experience the agent would get. If we just put it on the track, it wouldn't get nearly enough experience of trying to interact with these other agents. So we, we gave it a lot of scenarios where it started right behind one car or two or three or seven um, and uh, so that it could learn skills like a slipstream pass or a crossover pass, which I'll show you examples of. A slipstream pass is an interesting skill because there's aerodynamics. It's sort of like what a bicyclist would do when drafting behind another. You can, even on a straightaway, you can go behind another car where you're both flooring it, but you're in their slipstream, so you're going faster than they are, and then you can use your momentum to sort of bounce out and, and pass them. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, to do that, we had to give the car experience right behind the other car on straightaways. Um, there were particular parts of the track where we gave it extra experience. And then this was something that was a really important aspect of the, the success was um, doing stratified sampling from the experience replay buffer so that at different places around the track it would have a different mix of these different experiences. Um, and not only that that was the composition of the experience replay buffer, but we ensured that every mini batch would have exactly the right proportion. Um, in the Nature article, we did this manually, picking what, what the proportions would be. Since then, we've been, we've been working on automated methods to figure out you know, how do you uh, appropriately fill the experience replay buffer to do this kind of training. So I told you about the slipstream pass. Here's an example of that. Um, And I'd say, if you ever have a chance to have British announcers announce your research, you should. Um, it adds a lot of ex, uh, you know, verve to it. Um, I'll try not to talk over them. There's some nice, nice uh, narrations on here. Um, but that was an example of the slipstream pass. Here's an example of some good defending that was learned. So that was you know, the, the, the two colored GT Sophie agents um, blocking the, the humans. And this is my favorite one, uh, um, skill learned. It's a double crossover pass. So again, they'll be synced here, the, the right and the left. The gray line, or the red, sorry, the red line is where GT Sophie would go if it were um, driving on an empty track. But here, the, the GT Sophie is green and gray, starts out behind the two human agents um, and gets into a position where it comes out of the turn in, in front of them. So that's a, that was the, the crossover pass. Okay, and then the final component of this is the etiquette aspect. And these are the, the, the you know, sort of sportsmanship rules in, in racing. Um, you know, that you can't, uh, 
there, if there's an incident, there's a human steward that judges whether it was an avoidable collision or wh whether a driver was forced off the track or whether some illegitimate things happened. These are all judgment calls. Um, and they often look at the context, context when making these penalty determinations. Um, and, uh, you know, and if an agent is too timid, it can, you can have something like this happen. Here you'll hear the announcer saying, GT Sophie's in a commanding position, there's no way the human's gonna be able to pass, and then all of a sudden the human passes, and we found out afterwards it's because GT Sophie put on the brakes because it was worried um, about a collision. So here's that, what happens there. Here's what a person driving looks like. So that was an example of, the, of GT Sophie being too timid, and you can imagine what it looks like if it's too aggressive. We'll do things unfair like this. So you're not allowed to do that, push another car off the track. And so that was, uh, so there was uh, penalized, and so we had to build into the reward function penalties for you know sort of um, different types of collisions and tried to operationalize these concepts, but you know it was not fail safe. It wasn't wasn't foolproof, and so that led to the challenge of how do we select a driver that's going to actually race against the humans? We could train a whole bunch of agents, but we needed one that was going to go into the competition, and so um, we you know sort of created a big uh, multi-agent training paradigm um, where we create train a bunch of policies, check that they uh, have some conditions, like they go fast enough on an empty track, they can do the slipstream pass. We would then play them against each other and rank them, but then we'd have them human tested against a, a human expert who might tell us, you know what, that's a really fast agent, but it's way too aggressive. It's going to get penalized all the time, or it's way too timid, and, and then in the end, we might select the one that was ranked lower um, to go into the test. Okay, so the results, we first raced against people in July. It was set up as four people against four GT Sophie agents. The GT Sophie agents were all running the same policy, but independently, and they were not aware of which cars were human driven and which were GT Sophie agents, whereas the people were. Um, the, uh, we did it on three different tracks, and the scoring was that if you finished first in a race, you got 10 points, second, you got eight points, and then six, five, four, three, two, one for the other positions. And in that July 2nd race, um, the, the humans won. It was close, but the humans got 86 points to the, the GT Sophie agent 70. We doubled the score in the Cirque de la Sarthe because that's the, it was a longer race. It's where the 24-hour Le Mans happens um, in, the, in real life. It was sort of the more challenging one. And in the end, um, uh, GT Sophie was not able to win. And so, of course, we asked for a rematch. Um, and uh, which happened a few months later in October. Some of the things that didn't go well in July is the agent lost control a few times, it lost positions in the starts, it gave way unnecessarily, it didn't use our speed to, to close the gap. And so we were able to improve a whole bunch of things uh, between July and October. Um, first of all, being able to practice against some of the July agents helped a lot. Um, so we included July agents as opponents, opponents to, to test, and there's a good analysis in the um, in the uh, Nature article about the effect of your training population on how well the agent does. Is it, does it end up too confident uh, and too aggressive or overly cautious, or, or do we get the, um, you know, the, the right team score? And this, I won't go into the details here. But, the, uh, but ultimately, the, the final results in October were that GT Sophie finished first and second in all three races. The graphs on the right sort of show um, how far each agent is behind the first place agent. And you see GT Sophie was in the lead most of the time um, in all those races and basically doubled in points, the humans. And so that did lead to the, to the Nature article um, about a little more than a year ago. Um, uh, I'm running low on time, so I won't show this other video, but, but uh, we have some, some great driver testimonials. Um, you can read some of them here. I'll let you listen to, to Emily Jones speaking. Um,
So experts were learning from GT Sophie, which we've you know, seen in other um, uh, examples like in AlphaGo as well. Um, and then just to finish, just a few months ago now, or even just a few weeks ago, I guess, um, we did put this agent out into the video game. And I think this is one of the, the biggest commercial deployments of an end-to-end of -end reinforcement learning agent ever. Um, there were tens of thousands of people racing against it over the period of a, of a month. Um, the, uh, there, it, was a five, it was about a uh, five weeks or so. It's now taken down from the game, but we, we do hope to get it in permanently before too long. Um, there were some sort of five car races with different car, different car makes. Um, we needed to do a bunch of things to make, the, there was a way that you could play against a full, uh, you know, race against the same car in GT Sophie, but most of the time we gave people better cars than GT Sophie was in, so there'd be an advantage for the people, otherwise it wouldn't have been fun. Um, I, uh, you can look online, because of time I'm not going to replay any of these videos, but there was a lot of great positive reviews from, um, from people on, on YouTube uh, who you know, sort of showed their experiences um, racing and, and some, some great really rave reviews here, um, testimonials like you see here. Um, you know, the only problem with Sophie is that it's so good it spoils you, um, that we can see varying different levels of difficulty. Um, it's a thing of beauty, keeps the pressure up without driving dirty. And we had to, you know, to do this, it wasn't just deploy the nature article. We had to do a whole bunch of training with multiple car types with a single network now. Um, we had to make the game fun, but you know, sort of find, letting people find their level against GT Sophie. Um, make it a more exemplary driver against good and bad opponents. Um, they didn't want us to, you know, to do things that would look unrealistic in any way. Um, the people who, who make this game are very you know, sort of particular about, about you know, what, what gets out there and whether it's going to be um, aesthetically beautiful, not just, uh, not just fast. Um, and we got a lot of more experience with the, the makers of the game um, as they were sort of testing, testing the agent. We're not done. We still have, you know, there's upcoming challenges, working on tire wear, pit strategies, more strategic decision making, explainability, identifying the degree of which our, you know, to which our insights can apply to other domains. We've been putting out now papers in NeurIPS and, and TMLR and, and on some of the components of this. Um, a recent video where we changed the reward function to, to sort of um, drive with style by giving it extra points for, for drifting led to this. Um, very interesting behavior going around a turn where the, uh, human drivers would never try. Um, but it was able to, uh, able to pull that off. Um, and, um, and so that's it. That's, you know, and, then, and now, of course, because of the success in, in Gran Turismo, this team of people that's now grown to include some people in this, uh, in this room as well um, is now being uh, approached by many other makers of video games to try to see what we can do with reinforcement learning beyond just um, Gran Turismo. So we're still growing at, at Sony AI. Uh, it's not just about reinforcement learning in video games. The whole theme is using AI to unleash human imagination and creativity. There's projects on, um, on robotics, on AI for gastronomy, helping chefs, um, and we have a great AI ethics team as well. So with that, um, uh, you know, just as a, as a reminder, this is all in this context of practical reinforcement learning um, through representation, interaction, synthesis, mortality, and then this end part of the talk, a deep dive into uh, one of many examples of building an agent using reinforcement learning. Um, and, uh, and with that, if, there's, if people still have patience, I'd be, be happy to stick around and, and take any questions. Thanks for your attention. I guess you go to the mic if you want to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah. OK. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the talk. This is uh, really, really cool, because I, I spend a lot of time playing racing games. and. So I was really happy to see this happen. Um, uh, but yeah, one, a question that I had was, uh, so this Sophie interacts with a simulator at like 10 hertz, right? Uh, what's the, do you know statistically what humans sort of interact with these systems? And yeah, so we have a, we have a slide. Actually, uh, people, tend, people are sending um, steering commands and throttle commands faster than that, up to 60 hertz sometimes. Um, there, it, it, like, so we have, I, I don't know if I have the, um, Let's see if I can easily, I have a whole bunch of skipped slides. Let me see if I can easily identify this comparison slide. Um, 
where we show the, uh, I'll do it only if it's, where is it? Um, oh yeah, it was in this segment, sorry. Um, no, okay, I can't find it quickly. Um, but but we, we have examples of, of um, of where the, uh, oh, here it is. So here's, here's an, um, an example of um, GT Sophie's uh, reaction rates. It showed, it's sort of quantized, shown in orange, and the person's more smoothing, smoother curve, both for steering and for braking and throttle. So you see sort of um, more fine-grained behaviors by the people. And this was, it was this graph that we analyzed where we found out that counterintuitively Rather than braking later, GT Sophie was actually braking earlier than the people, and then um, and then accelerating out uh, more quickly. But uh, but yeah, so we did look at, at um, the and we also did experiments in the Nature article. This is sort of not what you asked, but related. What happens if there's a sensor delay between when the you know, when the state happens and when the person perceives it? It usually is 250 milliseconds. We gave GT Sophie that same sensor delay between you know, the state and the actuation opportunity, and was still able to achieve superhuman performance. Thank you so much. Uh, oh. First off, great talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Your lab has been uh, very prolific, clearly. Uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, you're here with a room full of academics of varying levels of success, and I wanted to hear if you had any advice for researchers at different levels of their career, be it a PhD student, leading a lab, uh, et cetera. How, long, how much time do we have? Um, I mean, there's, there's uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't have a, a pithy statement at hand. I think, you know, um, a lot of this has been inspired by my, my own interests and my own introspection. So, um, and a lot of it has been sticking to, you know, to what I think is important, right? I mean, one thing I, I, maybe if I, there's one thing I would say, and it's especially um, relevant today, is don't jump on the bandwagon because everybody else is. Don't just be doing what, you know, what everybody else is, thinks is, is important, but, to, you know, Figure out what you think is important. In fact, it's almost an advantage if not everybody else is doing it because then it's not going to be as much of a race. And, you know, when I started working on, I, I can't tell you how many papers I've had, you know, rejected because the reviewers don't think that robot soccer is, an, you know, an interesting problem or, you know, for this reason or that. But, it, you know, I, I knew what I wanted to work on. I kept working on it and, and you know, it, it was able to be published and it, it had influence, I think. So, so don't, you know, collaborate know what's going on, but develop your own taste of, of what you think is important, and don't be concerned if, if, uh, you know, if it's not what everybody else is, you know, is, is doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, let me... Okay, oh. last, one. last question. Oh, let me underscore again the, um, what you did is mind-blowing, and, but I also, other than driving and playing, I also like to drive cars. And my question will be, how difficult would it be to transfer the same algorithm into real life, considering all the little differences and, and the sensor you cannot have and all the, yeah. Yeah, the, the, you know. I mean, you know, it's tempting to say, you, you know, the policy could, could transfer. Um, I'm a roboticist, I know that's not the case. You know, th there's, there's a lot of com complexities in the real world. There's no way we could do this algorithm in the real world, right? We just learned from many, many, many experiences and it ran into the walls and things like that. We couldn't do that with real cars. Um, I think we, we would have to leverage a lot of sim to real research. It would be a fascinating, th fascinating thing to try. Our goal here was to do, you know, superhuman performance in the, uh, in the game itself and not to make it work on the real, in the real world, uh, on real cars. I mean, this is the real world. Video games, you know, in this sense is the, is the product for Sony. Um, but to make it work on real cars, you know, I, I think it would, would be another separate research paradigm and it would involve a lot of sim to real. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you.